we should expect less warming in the 21st century, even if CO2 levels continue increasing. When solar activity becomes high again, Arctic cooling and Arctic sea ice growth should occur. Nobody is expecting this, and it should be a big surprise when it happens. It might take place in less than two decades. I have Javier Vinos here today. He is the author of the 2022 book, Climate of the Past, Present, and Future, A Scientific Debate. First of all, thank you for inviting me here. It's my pleasure to appear in your podcast. I'm a molecular biologist, a scientist. My work on climate is really quite recent. And I started working on climate because I wanted to have some answers and I wasn't finding them from the official explanations. And it, I just got more involved and more involved uh, to the point which when I wanted to share with everybody what I have found about climate change. And you have a presentation to give us here today? Yes. Yes, I do. This is a story of a search for a little known phenomenon called natural climate change, a search that has taken me years. First, I looked to the IPCC for an answer. They are supposed to have all the answers about climate change. The IPCC defense that recent climate change has been caused mainly by greenhouse gas emissions of human origin. The main evidence is that CO2 levels and global temperature have been increasing over time. The correlation is generally good, although not so good, between 1915 and 45, when the early 20th century warming took place, nor during the mid-20th century cooling that followed. An increase in CO2 levels enhances the greenhouse effect. On a planet without greenhouse gases, the shortwave solar radiation is returned as longwave thermal radiation from the surface. When greenhouse gases are present in the atmosphere, they absorb and emit longwave radiation. As a result, the average height of emission is higher. If the planet has an atmosphere with a positive lapse rate, where the temperature decreases as the height increases, as the troposphere does, the surface must warm so the average emission altitude is sufficiently warm to return all the energy received from the sun. Doubling the amount of CO2 results in a higher average emission altitude and increased surface warming. The greenhouse effect depends on a positive lapse rate and a change in the average height of emission. That's why it doesn't work over Antarctica, where the surface is generally colder than the atmosphere. The greenhouse effect goes in reverse there and cools instead of warming. The increase in CO2 only produces a relatively small amount of direct warming, according to the greenhouse theory. Most of the warming is supposedly produced by poorly known feedbacks whose contribution to the warming cannot be measured because it cannot be distinguished from the signal. Even less known is the contribution from negative feedbacks. They must exist because the stable systems are dominated by negative feedbacks. The Irish effect was proposed by Professor Linsen, and we will see later that I propose Arctic warming as a negative feedback. Let's assume that all the observed warming is produced by the CO2 increase. The IPCC wrongly assumes this in climate sensitivity studies, so let's assume it too. Most of the warming should come from the feedbacks. In this graph, we see how this is supposed to work for the IPCC with a mean estimated climate sensitivity of 3 degrees Celsius per doubling of CO2. This result cannot be correct. Besides denying a natural climate change effect, it would make the pre-industrial climate far colder than it was. Climate scientists writing these reports defend that all climate change since 1750 has a human origin. Such an absurd claim defies common sense, but this is the outcome their models produce straight from the theory. There is only one possible conclusion. The theory is wrong or incomplete, and their models don't work. So the IPCC answer is that natural climate change is so feeble that it plays no role. All recent climate change has a human origin, and most of it is due to changes in greenhouse gas levels. It is time to look at the past and see what natural climate change was capable of doing. This graph shows in black global temperature changes over the past 50 million years from a famous article in Science, and in red, CO2 levels from a collection of proxies in an article by Birling and Roger. 
despite claims to the contrary by these authors, the data shows that most of the time, temperature and CO2 were moving in opposite directions for millions of years. There's a lot more disagreement than agreement in this graph. At the end of the Eocene, Antarctica froze up in less than a million years, and global temperature took a dive at a time when CO2 levels were the highest. Then, from the mid-Oligocene to the mid-Miocene climate optimum, the planet warmed quite a lot. Nobody has been able to explain it because CO2 sank to levels significantly lower than what we have today. That's the blue triangle in the figure. This is discussed in my book where I propose it was due to tectonic changes affecting heat transport. And if we look closer to today, for the past 11,000 years, the disagreement between temperature and CO2 continues. The black curve is a temperature reconstruction from 72 proxies published in a famous 2013 science paper, analyzed differently by me. The data is the same as originally published, but I have expressed it in standard deviations from the average for each proxy. I do not think we can possibly know the temperature of the planet then if we cannot know the temperature of the planet in the 19th century. Do not jump to conclusions about the end of the curve because it does not reach the present. The red curve is the CO2 levels from Antarctic cores. The range in CO2 levels is tiny, about 20 ppm, which is the change we get today in less than a decade. Even then, CO2 is always doing the opposite to temperature, going down when the temperature stays high and up when the temperature goes down. Despite these small CO2 changes, proxies from different parts of the world reflect at times important changes in temperature, wind, and precipitation. The coincidence in time of the changes for different kinds of proxies from different regions of the world reveals over 20 abrupt climate events over the past 11,000 years, or about two per millennium. These are times when climate parameters change much faster than the long-term baseline change. They appear to have different causes, and changes in greenhouse gases can only be a cause for the last one. I won't go over this list. This is in my book. But four of the biggest ones took place when solar activity was very low and are separated by multiples of 2,500 years. The last three are separated by close to that time and the first two by close to 5,000 years. If we go back to the temperature reconstruction, we observe these four events were among the biggest in terms of the temperature effect. The last one is known as the Little Ice Age. We are going to add the radiocarbon curve. It has been built since the 1960s by thousands of scientists, and it is rock-solid science. It is the basis for carbon dating. Scientists measure the ratio of 14C to 12C in their sample and establish a radiocarbon date. I didn't put that in the vertical axis to simplify the graph. Then they use this curve to translate this radiocarbon date into a calendar date. At times, solar activity becomes very low for a long time, and more cosmic rays arrive at the Earth, producing more 14C. So the radiocarbon clock runs faster, thinking that the samples are younger. This produces bumps in the curve. They correspond to grand solar minima. The four climate events coincide with four of the biggest grand solar minima of the past. They are of the sporer type, which lasts longer and reduces solar activity the most. There's a recent study on the past human population in the British Isles. Human population takes off after the arrival of farmers to the British Isles, and it shows a very good correspondence with the temperature reconstruction. Several of the changes coincide in time. When we look at the last three big climate events, we see a substantial population decrease coinciding with all of them. Look how the population drops. This agreement between independent sources is called consilience and says we are looking at a real phenomenon. When solar activity goes down for a long time, 
the climate takes a dive and humans suffer. No other explanation is consistent with this data. Paleoclimatologists have, have long recognized it. They write all the time in their articles about the solar modulation of climate on centennial timescales. They link low solar activity to cooling events, and they even talk about cyclical changes induced by small variations in solar radiation. They are good scientists in their field, but nobody listens to them. It is the wrong message, and we don't have an explanation for that. We are not even looking for that explanation. So I studied over 100 papers to see what the different proxies were saying was happening in different parts of the world during those four events. I was surprised this has not been done before, and a molecular biologist has to do it. The result is consistent with a complete reorganization of the atmosphere, which takes several decades to a century, and induces severe cooling. The Hadley cell contracts, the polar cell expands, the temperature gradient between the equator and the poles becomes steeper, and more heat is transported poleward, cooling the northern mid-latitudes. The Arctic initially warms from increased heat transport, but as more energy is being lost at the poles in winter, the entire planet starts cooling and the Arctic with it. The effect is strongest in the northern mid-latitudes. The longer the situation lasts, the colder the planet gets, despite solar activity remaining at the same low level, not much lower than during a regular solar minimum like in 2009. It is like opening a door in winter for a minute or six hours. The house gets much colder in the second case. The recovery from this atmospheric reorganization is also slow, producing a long period of warming once solar activity goes back to normal. So, Past climate analysis tell us that climate change and CO2 changes do not correlate most of the time. Most abrupt climate events we can identify in the past took place in the absence of significant greenhouse gas changes, and several of those events correlate with solar activity changes. So let's see what science can tell us about the natural climate change that is taking place now. The natural climate change the IPCC says doesn't matter. The AMO is defined as an oscillatory change in sea surface temperature at the North Atlantic. This image shows that during a warm AMO, the heat is accumulating at the mid-latitudes, pointing toward a heat transport issue. The energy input to the climate system is nearly constant from year to year, but energy transport is not, as heat accumulates in certain regions at certain times, as we see here. So the figure shows how heat is being extracted from the equator and directed poleward. And due to how the AMO is defined, here the focus is placed on the Atlantic. When we focus on the Pacific, we see something similar, which we call the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, or PDO. The ascending part of the AMO indicates low poleward transport, so heat accumulates in that basin. The descending part indicates the opposite. When we look at the cumulative PDO, we see that its phases agree quite well with the AMO, with some differences between basins. As was discovered in the 1990s, this strongly affects global temperature. If we detrend the temperature data, we can see the effect is about 0.3 degrees Celsius. The IPCC only cares about the trend I removed in the lower part of the figure, but that means they assume the oceanic oscillation is stationary, which it is not. I didn't, it did not have the same amplitude and period during the Little Ice Age. The amplitude of the oscillation got a lot stronger around 1850, when global warming started, suggesting it has contributed to global warming. Then we come to El Niño. El Niño is part of the heat transport system. When too much heat accumulates in the tropical Pacific, El Niño moves it out to the atmosphere. Colored squares in the figure represent the condition for each year. When we analyze the frequency for each condition separately, we discover that the frequency of Las Niñas in blue strongly anticorrelates to the frequency of neutral years in orange. There is no red curve because El Niño frequency is not represented. The gray curve is the solar cycle. Los Niños take place according to warm water accumulation. But the rest of the years, the decision to be a La Niña or a neutral year 
is strongly affected by the solar cycle. Neutral years follow solar activity, while Las Niñas do the opposite. This is reflected in a frequency analysis of El Niño by a peak in temperature change at the 11-year frequency. The graph is from a 2010 article that does not mention this peak, only the others. Due to the way solar radiation arrives to the Earth, more energy enters the climate system over the tropics than exits. Over the rest of the planet, more energy exits than the climate system than enters. To prevent the tropics from continuously warming and the rest of the planet from continuously cooling, heat has to be transported poleward. This heat transport is responsible for what we call weather and the hydrological cycle. Everything happens because there is energy running through the system. On average, energy exits the climate system at a higher latitude that it enters in. And we do not understand this transport well. Models do a poor representation of it. The right graph shows how much energy is transported at each latitude. It has this curious shape because the equator is just a line and very little energy is transported across it. And the poles are just a point that receives very little energy. The geometry of the Earth dictates that transport is largest at around 35 degrees because that's where heat from half of the hemisphere is transported to the other half. Close to the equator, the oceans transport most of the heat poleward, but soon after, the oceans transfer this heat to the atmosphere, and at mid-latitudes, the atmosphere does the bulk of poleward heat transport. At high latitudes, the atmosphere is responsible for almost all poleward heat transport. Here we see the net flux of radiation during the Northern Hemisphere winter at the top of the atmosphere. I have inverted the graph so the zero line represents the top of the atmosphere. The red area is the net energy into the climate system, and the blue area is the net energy out of the system towards space. The graph is not corrected for the geometry of the Earth. The dashed line is the temperature profile for the surface in January. It is clear from the graph that both the bigger loss of energy and the steeper temperature gradient demand a much larger heat transport toward the North Pole at this time of the year. As a result, the atmospheric circulation as the primary heat mover becomes more active during winter in each hemisphere. Think of it as a seesaw. Meridional transport and atmospheric circulation go from being strongest during winter in one hemisphere to be in lowest six months later. And this seesaw affects the planet's rotation speed. We are capable of me me measuring the length of the day with microsecond precision since the 1960s, after the invention of the atomic clock in the 50s. Although the semi-annual change in heat transport is comparable in both hemispheres, the semi-annual change in rotation speed is not, because the distribution of land and ocean between hemispheres is very asymmetric. So don't pay attention to the difference in arrow length as it is not related to the issue. This semi-annual change in the Earth's rotation speed is affected by the solar cycle. This effect has been reported every decade since the 1960s and never refuted, just ignored. Here, I cite three reports in the last 12 years and I graph two of them. In my book, I measured only the effect during the Northern Hemisphere winter, which gives a larger effect shown in the continuous black curve. The dotted curve is from Barlieva et al., using a more sophisticated method over the entire data set. To me, this is huge. As far as I remember, only Superman was capable of changing the Earth's rotation. Gravity does, but here we are talking about a tiny change, a tenth of a 1% in solar radiation. And yet, the IPCC tells us that such a small change cannot affect climate much. Well, here is the irrefutable proof that it does. The only way solar radiation can change the rotation is by changing the global atmospheric circulation. When solar activity is low, the Earth rotates faster in winter, which implies that it is making atmospheric circulation stronger and transporting more heat poleward. And the opposite happens when solar activity is high. So scientific evidence shows 
Oceanic constellations strongly affect climate and meridional transport. El Niño is also a part of the transport system, which is modulated by solar activity. And winter atmospheric circulation is also modulated by solar activity. After consulting many thousands of articles, with over 750 of them referenced in my book, I had the radical idea that natural climate change is essentially a change in the transport of energy, and that what happens at the poles in winter is the reason we are in an ice age, and one of the main reasons the planet has been warming over the past centuries. I call this idea the winter gatekeeper hypothesis. What this hypothesis defends is that the main natural climate change mechanism at all time scales is a persistent change in the amount of energy transported to the winter poles. At different time scales, different factors affect this meridional transport. The polar vortex acts as an energy barrier for the winter pole. Its strength regulates how much energy is lost every winter at the poles. On centennial time scales, solar activity is the main factor regulating meridional transport. It does this by affecting polar vortex strength and winter atmospheric circulation. Solar activity acts through stratospheric ozone, altering the planetary wave flux that controls polar vortex strength. Thus, the sun acts on climate as a winter gatekeeper. Persistently low solar activity causes increased energy loss by the planet, northern mid-latitude cooling, and Arctic warming. Persistently high solar activity has the opposite effect. This image is a graphical representation of the winter gatekeeper concept. It shows the horizontal temperature gradient in degrees Celsius per 100 kilometers in the stratosphere during the month of January. Something similar occurs in the tropospheric polar vortex that continues down to the middle troposphere. The area within this barrier is in constant darkness and extremely cold. Little of the heat outside crosses this barrier unless the vortex weakens. Whatever affects the strength of this barrier constitutes a winter gatekeeper, and the sun acts as such. This image is from a recent paper by Svetlana Vretenenko. Her work supports my finding that solar activity affects global atmospheric circulation, in part through the polar vortex. This is an important piece of the winter gatekeeper hypothesis. My hypothesis is more complete, as it includes how this is achieved through stratospheric ozone and the planetary wave flux, and how climate change is about meridional transport and anything that affects it. So the sun is just a part of the story, although the most intriguing. Crucial evidence for the winter gatekeeper hypothesis is that solar activity negatively correlates with winter Arctic warming. Global warming strongly accelerated around 1975, after a previous cooling period. Arctic amplification, the enhanced warming at the poles, has been a model prediction from the beginning, but didn't start until the mid-1990s. To date, nobody has been able to explain why the strong warming of the late 1970s, the 80s, and the early 90s did not produce it. A climate shift took place in 1997. As a result, a lot more energy is being lost towards space in the Arctic. Nearly all the energy lost to space during the Arctic winter is transported there from lower latitudes. That energy has no other place to go but to space, as the energy flux through sea ice is always from the ocean to the atmosphere. Frequent temperature inversions make the surface colder than the atmosphere, and radi radiation cooling is the dominant energy process. By the time the sun returns, that energy is gone forever. If you want an explanation for the famous pause in global warming between 1998 and 2014, you need to look no further. Global warming was deprived of a lot of energy after 1997 by the Arctic shift. And this data indicates the pause is continuing in 2023, despite the 2015 El Niño heat redistribution. The effect of solar activity on energy loss in the Arctic is not an over-interpretation of insufficient data. The anti-correlation between solar activity and Greenland temperature goes back at least 2,100 years. The article showing it was published by well-known authors 
of very good climate science, like Takuro Kobashi, Bob Winther, Tom Blunier, and James Wise. The article's title resumes the results of the study, but an inescapable conclusion is not mentioned anywhere in the article. The end of the modern solar maximum in the 21st century must be causing Greenland warming. This diagram shows how meridional heat transport is affected by different players and how it affects climate. When solar activity is high, the stratospheric temperature gradient is stronger, favoring a strong vortex. This effect is counteracted by an easterly tropical wind circulation or by El Nino, so variability is high. A strong polar vortex favors a weak meridional transport, and if it coincides with a rising oceanic oscillation phase, which also reduces heat transport, the result is enhanced global warming, a cold winter Arctic, and warm winter continents, as we had in the last quarter of the 20th century. When solar activity is low, the stratospheric temperature gradient is weaker, favoring a weaker vortex. But this effect is counteracted by a westerly tropical wind circulation, by La Niña, and by volcanic eruptions. So variability is also high. A weak polar vortex favors a strong meridional transport. And if it coincides with a decreasing oceanic oscillation phase that also increases heat transport, the result is reduced global warming or even cooling a warm winter Arctic and cold winter continents, like we are having in the first quarter of the 21st century. The winter gatekeeper hypothesis provides a good explanation for the surface temperature evolution over the past 120 years, indicating that recent climate change might have a strong natural component. In this graph, I have removed the vertical axis and the data is presented after a Gaussian filter smoothing to make it simpler. Two of the main factors affecting meridional transport are displayed. Solar activity on top and the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation at the bottom. In the middle is the global surface temperature showing early 20th century warming, mid 20th century cooling, and late 20th century warming. There is a correspondence between the heat transport strength and the global temperature effect as indicated by the overlapping colors. The data supports that oceanic oscillation has a stronger effect on transport and surface temperature than solar activity, as seen in the 1920s warming when solar activity was low. But what made a difference for the 20th century was the modern solar maximum. By strongly increasing the warming in the 1940s and the 1975 to 2000 period, and by reducing the amount of cooling in the 1945 to 75 period. This supports that natural climate change has strongly contributed to global warming. It does not say how much warming has a natural origin and how much is human caused. For that, I have no answer. The winter gatekeeper hypothesis produces a set of predictions that are remarkable opposite, remarkably opposite to what models project. As solar activity is low and the AMO is about to start decreasing, we should expect little warming or even a slight cooling until at least 2035. The 20th century was exceptional in terms of heat transport conditions. We should expect less warming in the 21st century, even if CO2 levels continue increasing. When solar activity becomes high again, Arctic cooling and Arctic sea ice growth should occur. Nobody is expecting this, and it should be a big surprise when it happens. It might take place in less than two decades. The science behind, behind this new explanation for climate change from a million years ago to the next glaciation is fully supported by over 750 scientific references in the book I published recently. I priced it very cheap so everybody can have it, but if someone cannot buy it, my book can be downloaded free from my research gate page. Just uh, Google my name. Since this is complex stuff, Andy May and I are writing a new book to explain this novel global warming hypothesis. We are trying to make it easier for anybody interested in knowing that the science is not settled. I was lucky in knowing Andy May. We've been collaborating for many years. He's a retired petrophysicist with a very good understanding of climate science and a very good writer, an uncommon combination. He has written three books on climate that I fully recommend, and he also writes about history.
He has a climate blog here where you can find our joint or separate climate articles and some of the figures I have shown. I also want to acknowledge Judith Curry and Peter Webster. Without Judy, my book would have never been published. Our climate blog is where my book took form between 2016 and 18, before the first edition was accepted by Springer. Peter provides very good advice on the second edition. Willison has encouraged me and helped me over the years. He's a shining light and a role model in climate science. And Anthony Watts has published many of my articles on his site over the years. So this is the story of my search for natural climate change. And time will tell how successful it has been. But for me, it has been an enlightening trip that I'm happy to have shared with you today. That was gold. That was just brilliant stuff. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm glad you liked it. I think people are really going to enjoy watching this. I'm going to enjoy watching it again because I need to absorb it more a second time through it. But great stuff. You sent me your slides as a PDF. Is it okay if I put them up on Substack and put them in the show notes so people can see your... Yes, absolutely. No problem. Okay. And then I will put a link in the show notes to the, to the information about your book. They can mm -hmm. either buy it or download it. And then I'm still embarrassed that I botched your name. Could you say your name correctly just so that people can hear it said correctly? My name is Javier Binoz. Very good. Very good. Thank you for doing that. Anything else we should cover here, do you think? Or should we just wrap it up? No, I just wanted to comment that this is very complex stuff. I think climate change is one of the most complex things that we can research together with the human mind of the, the nature of the universe. And the IPCC is giving us a very simple idea and... Uh, it would be great if it was true, but it looks like it isn't. I think there's a lot more complexity here that it's being ignored. And they have settled for a simple explanation. And now they're trying to fit the evidence that doesn't really fit into the theory. They're trying to explain it away. So I think that we are not going to get an easy answer about what is the cause of, the, of climate change. And we need to do a lot more research. It's probably that the answer that I have found, my hypothesis, I don't know if it will be correct or not, is just a call of attention that there's alternative explanations to the one we are being offered. And I think uh, this should serve other scientists to consider possible alternatives to what they're seeing. Because in science, it is important that you don't think that you have the answers. What really drives science is ignorance. So the first step is to recognize that there's a lot about climate change that we do not understand. And so our ignorance about climate change is very big, and we should not give the impression that we already have all the answers for this, because we clearly don't. Richard Feynman said in a class in the 1960s that he could safely say that nobody understood um, quantum mechanics. And I think we can say exactly the same about climate change. I don't think there's anybody on the planet that can safely say that he does understand climate change because it's just too complicated for anybody to understand it at this point. Did I hear you correctly that increased CO2 should cause cooling in Antarctica? Yes, that's correct. I'm not the only one saying this. Dr. William Hopper and David Winhart Garten have published a, an article in which they show why this is what it should happen. And this really fits very well the evidence that we see that Antarctica is not warming, it's actually cooling. And so obviously the greenhouse effect doesn't work the same way over there. All right. And also you said that increased solar activity should cause cooling in the Arctic, correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay. Yeah. That's counterintuitive stuff there. All right. Yes. I think I'm good here. If you're good, I'll go ahead and uh, work on getting this published. But thanks again for doing this. I hope to have you on again sometime if you have more time. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Talk to you next time. Bye. Bye.